All right, all right. Well, good morning, guys. Good morning, man. We are glad that you are here in the house. And so uh, everybody have a good 4th of July. Hopefully, hopefully. Anybody get rained on, held on on the 4th of July? Yeah. We were in the back porch. Usually we have the church out in the Broomfield Commons, and we were thinking, man, every year we all had to get under the tent. I was so glad we weren't out there this time. So, man, a lot. Uh, sorry for the voice, man. I'm going to get a halls going. I haven't started teaching. That worship was awesome, Oren. Man, good job, y'all. That was so much fun. So much fun. So if you are a guest here, we have been journeying this summer. We started into the book of Joshua. And so go to the sixth book, uh, the, the Bible, Old Testament, kind of Genesis forward. And we're actually going to be getting into the sixth chapter today. So hopefully you've read into that uh, this morning. Um, next week we'll be in chapter seven and eight. So if you want to get a head start on that. But we're talking about being strong and courageous being strong and courageous. Remember when you have discouragement, that that's a lack of courage. That That's the courage to step into a situation, step forward. And I'm telling you, God's given us a word today out of chapter 6 that I just believe is really going to encourage us in our journey. John 16, 33, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. Right here is where we're going. In the world you have tribulation, but do what? Take courage. Take courage. And I've been telling you the last few weeks, man, there's been a number of things that I've literally found myself out loud saying, I'm going to take courage today to step forward. And so no matter what we're going through, God's word stands true. Take courage because Jesus promised, I have overcome the world. So we are in a journey to understand what God did in and through this, this Hebrew military leader named Joshua. And so I encourage you if, you, if you haven't started reading, go ahead and jump into it this week, and you're going to start seeing a lot of, of really cool stories, not only, but types and shadows, pictures of what God wants us to understand, not only about Joshua or Yeshua being a, a type and shadow of Jesus, a Savior, a Redeemer, but also us. What does it look like to be put in positions where you've got to journey by faith, take steps of faith, got to be obedient to, to things that sometimes don't make sense? And I'm just going to tell you, along the way, God will give us courage, courage to start a new season in life, step into a new season. Come on, no matter what it is we're journeying through, come on. You've got a big change in the house right now to have courage to step in. Come on, courage to step into what seems discouraging. And so for us, I believe God has got a word that where we internally would want to stop short of the promise God's going to show us in this story of what it looks like for us to keep going. Are you with me? All right. So I'm encouraging you to take some notes if you need to today. I've got a few things I want to pack, but just repeat after me. I want to grow. God, you have more. I want to know it. I want to know it. So as we dive into this, this word God's given, it's going to start before we go back and read out of the book of Joshua. Hebrews 10.36 is like the key verse for us. And two, let me just add, parents, thanks for letting us call an audible today. I know uh, we didn't have kids church today, so I just want to say thank you to your parents for, for just, just flowing with what we had to do today on that. Hebrews 10.36 you need, the writer of Hebrews is penning this, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Let me read that again. Again, scholars debate who actually wrote this, Paul or someone else, but whoever's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is talking to each of us today in this room. I know there'll be people later as we load this on our, our YouTube page, and again, until we get the stage lights uh, rehung, uh, some of you guests in the room, we just had a whole renovation that all, there was tons of stuff up here that got removed, so we haven't rehung the stage lights. As soon as that happens, we'll get that going uh, online again, uh, and then Kids Church has renovations happening next month, so... Oh, it's going to be fun watching all that change happen. But, but right here, Hebrews 10, 36, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And when I read that, I was like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like a, a suggestion, you know? Uh, you know, if you get around to it, if you think about it, if it feels good, then persevere. No, it's almost more of the tone of admonition, a command. Persevere. You need to persevere. Say that. I need to personalize it. I need to 
persevere. That means don't quit. It means it's possible, based off the scripture, to do God's will, or at least take what we talked about last week, taking the step of faith, to start God's will. It's, it's, it's possible that we do both those things and not finish, therefore, not receive the full extent of what he has promised for you and I in our life. You can start it, you can get going, but he says you need to persevere after so that when you have done the will of God. See, a lot of times we want the promise manifested before we've done the will of God. We want God to do this part before we do our part. Does that that make sense? We're like, well, if he does this part, then I will. But that's not what we find through scripture, especially in this book of Joshua. You look at Daniel. You can, I mean, we'll look at some other examples through the Bible, but usually God says, I'm looking for someone who's obedient and willing to persevere into what I told them to do, then I'm going to show up. That tends to be how it happens, this admonition. You need to persevere. It's It's like a parent telling you, kids, you need to brush your teeth. That's not a suggestion. As a parent, you're like, you're telling them, go brush your teeth. It's, that's the feel. An admonition to persevere. It's the link. It's our part to play in the equation. So it's exciting. Yes, it's exciting when we start something, right? Or we're around somebody and they're starting, they're kicking off a, a new business venture, a ministry, or you know, a new child. Warren's got a new kid on the way. Come on, that's going to be a big kickstart in your world too. I mean, you got the, these, these starts to things. It's the continuation that we see through the eyes of spiritual maturity. It's not just the, the, the step of faith, which we need that. We spent a whole service talking about that last week. But the applause comes really, not the faith to start, but the fortitude to finish. See, that's what we're after is to keep going. Keep going. You need to persevere that after you've done the will of God, you will see the manifestation of the promise. It's what the writer's telling us in Hebrews. So again, let's jump to Joshua chapter 6, sixth book of the Bible, chapter 6. And we're going to look at a story that many of us have read. We've been in church. You've heard this. Maybe you heard a song. We'll allude to later. But right here, chapter 6, verse 1. Now Jericho, city of Jericho, was shut up inside and outside. Because the people of Israel, none went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, remember Joshua is the leader of all the Israelites now. Moses has died. Joshua's in charge. God talks to Joshua. See, I have given Jericho into your hands with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Say six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. God likes this number seven, just saying. Round seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall flat. And the people shall go up, every one straight before him. Verse 6, so Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, go forward, march around the city and let the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests, were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark, while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, now get this, just just picture this, this huge, we're talking about tens of thousands of Israelites walking around Jericho. You got armed men at the front, you got the Ark of the Covenant and priests in the middle, then you got armed guards and uh, military officers, however you want to say it, uh, after the ark. But all you're going to hear is all the shofars, those ram's horns, blaring. Because see what happens. Joshua commanded the people, verse 10, you shall not shout or make your voice heard 
neither shall, because, I mean, you stop there and you're like, okay, okay, I'm processing this. Uh, again, y'all know I love to get in this story. Thinking about this. You're in the military. You're in the army. You're in the group. You're about to go out. You're going to war. Most of the time, you're getting pumped up. You're like, oh, it's like think of football. You know, you see these guys like banging their head again, like, yeah, we're going to war. What you're going to do is not say a word. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth. Until the day I tell you to shout. Now, you're going to start seeing this story. There's so much. We, we just hear that Joshua bought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. You know, like, there's so much detail into this story. Neither shall any word, say any word, go out of your mouth until when? Until the day I tell you to shout. Which day did God tell him? To shout. Okay, well, we'll get back to that. So then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about it once. They came to the camp, spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, walked on. They blew the trumpets continually. Talk about a marching band. Boy, they, they got their work out there. And the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord while the trumpets blew continually. Verse 14 is where we're going to stop. And the second day, they marched around the city once, returned to the camp. So they did it for six days. Okay, man, you talk about this. This is going to be a beautiful picture of type and shadow and picture for us. When, when we feel like there's an insurmountable odd for us to overcome, for us to conquer, for us to get through, for us to break through, this is a good story for us to get a good picture of how God enables us and sometimes leads us in a way to victory that doesn't seem normal to the natural comprehension and thought. I want us to get to this. So, so today's title, if you're taking notes, Don't Stop at Six. Don't Stop at Six. So we're going to talk today. We're going to pack three, re three reasons I think that people stop short. Stop short of the promise. Stop short of the passion for what you're doing. I mean, there's people that stop short in ministry and what they're believing for, in, in businesses, in marriages. I mean, people stop short for so many different reasons. Why do people, why do people stop short? And that's what I want to pack out of this story today. And, and for us, we probably don't have a geographical location called a land of milk and honey, right? We, we probably don't have a, a piece of property that's called the promised land, but we each have been given, according to Peter in his second letter, God has given us his great and precious promises. Paul said every spiritual blessing in Christ, we all have something that we can call our land of milk and honey. We have something God's given us, something we're, we're marching toward, believing for, working towards, sweat, equity involved in this. And so God's given the promise. We just saw, you know, looking back these last few weeks of how he pulls back the water, not just like he did the Red Sea, he did it, the Jordan River, pulls back the water. They cross on dry ground. But to take the promise, there's opposition. See, oftentimes we're like, man, if, you know, if we want to take a type and shadow and a picture of, of, you know, leaving Egypt, getting out of sin, going into God's promises, you know, God making a way, there's still opposition to us living in the promise. This side of heaven, there will always be resistance, period. I mean, you know, I, I would love if all of us had all the finances of the world and we could unhook and just sit on a beach every day. But somewhere along the way, we'd have to deal with a hurricane coming through. We'd have to, you know, like, like this, I'm trying to give you like whatever is the pif perfect picture in your head of, of complete ease. Life of ease is what well, the Veggie Tales had that, that the one, life of ease. You know, like whatever your perfect picture, it, that, there's not one this side of heaven. There's always going to be something that comes against you to keep you from pursuing all that God has for you. We say all the time, being highway, we are on a journey with Jesus. We want to become more engaged, followers of Jesus, disciples. We want to lean in, but we're on this journey with Jesus, and every one of us today has a next step. And that means if we are moving forward, there is resistance. I've said it before, you, do, you don't have a breakthrough unless there's resistance, or it's not a breakthrough. I mean, that's the definition of breakthrough. There's resistance that you got through. 
And so whatever it is that we're wrestling with that's causing us internally to think we can't do it, we should stop, God's saying, wait, let's look at what happened in Scripture, how God came through. We had a whole series before this, but God, how God can come through for you in this moment in your story. So Jericho, Jericho wasn't large in circumference per se. It's not like, like they, they came to the city and it's like, oh man, like, I mean, you know, that probably would have been even a more excruciating walk if it was really big. No, what it was known for was the high walls, the thick walls, like that's what it was known for. And here to come into the promise, the very first thing that they're coming against is this fortified city, Jericho. So right out of the gate, they got a battle. They got, they've got something to overcome. They've got a breakthrough that's needed to start taking the land. Now, I encourage you to go back to your research on why God gave them land and why God said drive out the inhabitants of the land. God's saying there was so much spiritual perversion in that region. I don't know if you call it a nation, the land of Canaan. I don't know what, there was a lot of tribes throughout that. And God was saying that this was a land generations, hundreds of years ago, God had promised Abraham that his descendants would come and this would be their land. Now, verse two, it's interesting. Let's go back, kind of start looking at this. God talking to Joshua, right out of the gate, he says, see, I have given you Jericho into your hand. Now, now again, we can just read over something. You're like, if I'm Joshua, I'm like, I haven't, I haven't even, we haven't even started the battle. See, Joshua, I have, past tense, given Jericho into your hands. See, oftentimes we're like, again, what's God, God's looking at it from the other side, like, you've, we've already won this thing. Like, so, so, you know, we look through the lens of our frustration and the cloud of what's going on and the, the challenges, the, the feelings, the emotions, and God's looking at it like, I already gave that to you. Like, what are we waiting on? So if God starts talking to you and it sounds like it's past tense, like you, you're already past this, God's already past this. He's already given it into your hands. God speaks about your battle that you're currently in in past tense. But let's get back to the three reasons why we stop short, we give up. First, your perspective sometimes is obstructed. Your perspective what you can see in the situation is obstructed. You, you can't quite see what God says. What's the first word he, the Lord said to Joshua? See. Or in, I don't even knew where I was going, and he just prayed right there, open, open eyes for understanding. We need to be able to see. See, I have. God's referring to Joshua in this moment of this victory, saying, you have, you have because I have. See, can you see I have given you this city? So here's the challenge. God says, I have given in your hands. Joshua sees gates that are fortified and, and locked up. So, so here's our challenge. What do you do when what you see looks nothing like what God says? What do you do? See, when we're talking about our, our, our um, perspective being obstructed, what do you do when your situation looks nothing like what God is speaking to you in your spirit about it? Because I see the natural, but God, I feel you're saying this about my situation. See, Joshua could have easily looked over the reason the city gates were barred. It said in verse 1, it was barred because of them. The people in the city, the enemy, was terrified of the Israelites. They were terrified of the God of the Israelites. They're so scared. They're like, maybe we shut it up. They won't get in, and they'll move on. See, the reason Joshua wasn't able to see fully what God could see in the situation, the intensity of the opposition in your life oftentimes is proof of the power of God's promise given to you in your life too. Intensity. 
See, oftentimes the intensity of the opposition doesn't come by one thing resisting. It comes when multiple things start happening, multiple things start happening, multiple. And now all of a sudden it feels like everything's touching and you can't break through. And it's like, man, I feel resistance on every side. And God, how in the world am I dealing with so much when you called me, Jesus, to live in abundant life? Resistance. And it causes us to have our perspective obstructed and we're not seeing how God wants us to see. The enemy was intimidated by the Israelites. Remember, we, we covered that, I think, in chapter 2. Rahab the harlot, the spies are sent in, and she is telling them quotes and says, like, our hearts melted like wax when we heard what your God did for y'all. Like, we are terrified. See, they were scared of God's people Therefore, the enemy was resisting by just simply locking down the house. So what do we need? We need clarity. Some of you today, in your journey, in your situation, we need clarity. We need to be able to see from God's perspective on this thing. And I alluded to it, with talking about Orem, but Ephesians, Paul said in chapter 1, verse 18, that I pray, he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart, the understanding of your heart may be enlightened. Like all of a sudden, the lights came on. You know, it's interesting. I was watching this documentary on TV the other day. Uh, I can't remember where this cave was, but the fascinating thing is they had turned it into a, this, it might have been Texas, but there's a restaurant in there. There's actually like a, I uh, think Airbnb, like there's this room you could rent um, to sleep. And the, the owner, I guess, or manager, I don't know if you can own a cave, but the manager of it was saying like, literally, when you shut off all the lights, it's so dark. He said, you, start, you, 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 you can't even see your hand. You, you, you start losing sense of what is up and what is down and how to navigate. Like, that's what darkness does. And we get in the middle of a situation, it becomes so clouded and so dark and so oppressive that all of a sudden we start losing our orient orientation of which direction is the right direction to go. And for us, we've got to get that clarity. We've got to get that perspective. So how do we, how do we shift when it's a natural resistance and we're feeling God leading us. How do we shift? And I was thinking about, bless you. I was thinking about that. What is the spiritual tool in our tool belt God's given us? And, and we were just experiencing it to one degree. I think it's this thing called praise, worship. It's, it's pushing the boundaries of I am going to exalt God with my spirit, with my intentionality, with my purpose. I'm choosing to exalt God over exalting my issue, my problem. See, we can read over the story of why did Joshua tell the people to keep your mouth shut? Because we tend to praise the problem. We tend to speak the problem. I mean, all of us are guilty of it. I mean, the, the harder it gets, the more frustrated we are. We lash out at people we love. I mean, I did that this last, last week. Miss and I haven't talked to her. I'm like, so oh, sorry, babe. Like, I'm dealing with this internally, and I took it out on you. I mean, anybody there? I mean, like, we do that to the people we love. It happens. You get all inside about what you're dealing with, and then you don't realize, man, it's got dark. I've lost my perspective. And so what praise does, it's a tool, it's a weapon that God's given us to all of a sudden now, we're going to exalt God over our situation. The Israelites were commanded by the general, if you will. Joshua said, don't even open your mouth till I tell you. We'll get back to that here in a second, but praise. You know, it's interesting, a lot of times we, we do, you know, child dedications or baby dedications, and, you know, I talk about Jesus' example of let the children come to me, and he was talking one time to his disciples and followers and people listening about praise. He quoted this passage out of Psalms, the psalmist writes this, and he changed it just a little bit for us to understand, but he said, through praise, through praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against the enemies to silence the foe. And the avenger. So we take the first few words, the last few words, through praise, you silence the foe. Or if you want to call it the avenger. Through praise, you silence the foe. Through praise, you silence the foe. Through praise, see, praise is the weapon of warfare for the children of God against the enemy. What happens is when we don't feel like it, see, the enemy acts like, thinks like, attempts to surround us thinks he's got us, and all of a sudden, instead of us replying and responding like we would naturally, all of a sudden, our response is praise. 
whoa, you talk about throwing the enemy in chaos? You know, it's a Paul and Silas in prison kind of moment when all of a sudden what they would have naturally wanted to do is complain and talk about how bad it is, talk about how unfair it is, talk about how everything's against them. What do they do? They turn to praise. It is a weapon of warfare in the spirit that God's given us. What was the one thing that commanded by God through Joshua to the people to be the sound? The worshipers, the trumpets, shofars. The entire walk, march around the city, the only sound was these trumpets blaring, resonating, the sound resonated, reverbing, or resonating off the reverb, off the walls. That was the sound that was, and I don't know, again, the circumference of how, I mean, they, they very well might have got back and, I mean, they're, they're lapping each other. I mean, I don't know, but this, this sound of trumpets is the only thing. You talk about if people inside were already terrified. I mean, they're just marching and I mean, it's like, you know, they're talking smack with trumpets. See, that's how we talk smack is our praise against the enemy. I mean, that's our weapon. That's the thing that causes us to start resisting the enemy, confuses, throws the enemy in chaos. So when Satan surrounds you, seemingly no way out, what do we do? Think about this story. What can come out of our mouth can dictate the outcome of this situation. I mean, Proverbs says the power of life and death is in the tongue, and those that use it will eat its fruit. I mean, what kind of fruit do we want in this situation? The situation is tough already. We can add to it with what we're declaring that's agreeing with it, really, good way to say it. Or our praise, all of a sudden we shift to gratitude, to gratitude. That's what praise is, to gratitude. Hallelujah. It's like, it's a Hebrew word. You know, we just sing it, hallelujah, hala, uh, or hallel, I should say like that, but a hala, you know, like hallel is praise, Jah, that J is a short form of Jehovah, Je like Yahweh, God, praise God is what, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallel, Jah. So when we start giving that praise, we're putting God in the position, in the situation that the enemy didn't expect us to, to put him in. When we do the opposite, it causes the enemy to change what it can do through us. It's a weapon. So our perspective first could be obstructed, or in the number two thing, our progress is an obvious. Progress is an obvious. You know, I was thinking about that song. Uh, how many of y'all heard that growing up? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho. Jericho, it's, it's an old spiritual that, that, that definitely came back uh, to life in, in the season of Martin Luther King Jr. and the, all the, the abolitionists. And there's actually, if you're in the Version app, you can see I put a YouTube in one of uh, uh, Dr. King's rallies uh, with well, this lady singing Josh for the Battle of Jericho. That, that opposition seemed insurmountable. And easily, I guarantee you, for those of that day that were fighting and believing for it, it could have seemed like there was no progress being made. But they didn't stop. They kept fighting. That, that song was so fitting for that time and that season, but it's just as fitting for us in the journey. See, we look and we, we tend to do the bad thing. We compare our life to other people. We compare our situation to others. We have no idea honestly, what they're going through, because we look at them like, ah, it's never bad, or look how quick they won that, or they beat that fight, and over here, you feel like you lost that fight. We, we get into that comparison all the time. It's like, it's like Joshua coming into Jericho, and, and all the people are like, wow, that guy's instant success. But you back up, 40 years he was walking through the wilderness because of everybody else's lack of faith. He was the same guy when Moses would leave the tabernacle, the tent of meeting God's presence. It said Moses would leave, Joshua would stay there at the door of the tent. He learned 40 years of, of, of getting ready for this moment. It's like a, you ever watch like a professional fight, boxing, uh, karate, MMA, something like that, like, like and it's over, like in a matter of seconds, minutes. And you're looking at that like, oh, they made that look easy. Now, I wouldn't tell that person how easy it was for them 
Because they would tell you of the six months, eight months of all the hours, up early, training, sweat, tears, blood, all that to make it look easy in that moment, overnight success. See, we don't see oftentimes the progress. Progress is behind the scenes. Joshua's gone through it all. I mean, I'm just thinking, again, put myself in Joshua's. We're right there. We just crossed the Jordan River, and now we get to spend the next seven days walking. Awesome. Just didn't have enough exercise yet, God. Just some more walking. That's fantastic. I mean, like, processing that, walk around the city each day, get to the seven, seven times, thank you, God, for that, then shout. I mean, a good question if I was just my normal self in those sandals, well, am I going to see any progress along the way? I mean, you know, you think it's like, you know, Tetris, you know, you get the blocks right and then, you know, like, and couldn't, couldn't God just like drop it down a couple layers of bricks, you know, each day? Like, I mean, just, just thinking that that would have been a little motivation, right? I mean, you know, it's like, it's like, I, I love to go work out. It's like my kind of outlet and what I do. And man, it would just be awesome if you did like a push up and then your pecs go, boom. I mean, that would be awesome. I, I think all of us would be much more motivated. But it's day after day after day after month after year. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been trying to go three days a week. And it was like a few weeks ago, I walked through the house. Uh, I think I was going to, to iron my shirt. And Mrs. is like, ah, I'm starting to see a little definition on your chest. I think she's just flirting with me, actually. But, uh. but I was like, you know, I wish I could just do one thing and Bam. But see, oftentimes the progress isn't obvious. You don't see the result because it takes so long. It can be frustrating us. I mean, that's why, you know, I mean, to, to the whole gym idea, people, you know, New Year's resolutions, they get signed up, they're locked into a year. Jim's like, oh, that's great because I get your money. I don't have to see you. And by week two, three, you're like, I don't see the results. No, because it's progress. It's not obvious. Israelites every day were getting nothing. Getting nothing. I mean, I was thinking about, it's like the Syrian commander Naaman. I don't know if you remember that story. Second Kings chapter 5. So he has leprosy. Leprosy is an, is, is an unpleasant disease of that day. It's still in some countries uh, even today. But but bad things were just not happening with, I mean, we're, we're good with their body. I don't want to be graphic. Got kids in the room. But Naaman is in a position of authority, a general in the Syrian army. So the king of Syria sends him because he's heard word that there's a prophet in Israel or Judah. And so the king sends him to the king of Israel or Judah and, and says, heal him. Of course, the king's like, what in the world? How can I heal and then all of a sudden, someone says, oh, no, send him to the prophet. Send him to Elisha. And so Naaman thinking, oh, it's going to be a lot of fanfare, big wave of the hands in front of everybody, and bam, I'm going to be healed. Not only did Elisha not even come to the door, he sends a servant to this big name general and says, tell him to go to the Jordan and dip under the water seven times. Again, the number seven. Naaman is furious. He's like, who does this man think he is to tell me to go dip my body in this dirty river? He literally says that. How many good rivers do we have back in Syria? I got to do this in the Jordan. He walks away or drives away his chariot fuming and his servant says, whoa, 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 Naaman. It's such a simple thing he asked you to do. If he had asked you a big thing to do, wouldn't you have done it? It's just a simple thing. Why don't you go do this? And so you take this story, listens to the wisdom of his servant, and he goes to the Jordan River, gets in the water, and again, you have a terminal disease, and the answer is go under the water seven times. Dip. 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 Zip, baby. <laughs> I, mean, like, I mean, you know, like, it gets to six times and still nothing. You get up out of the water and you're like, I just got one more here. I mean, like, nothing has changed. Remember our title? Don't stop at six. 
Don't stop before you get to the result. Another lap around the city, another day, or another lap, nothing moves, no brick falls. Now you talk about a great example in the Old Testament of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, that Joshua walk, live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. This is a story. This is, this is the example for us to sink our faith teeth into. The question becomes, will you, personalize it, will you keep walking when it doesn't seem to be working? And that, that's, that's, that's a question to all of us. Can we still believe that God is moving even when the wall hasn't moved at all? The situation hasn't changed. And here's the key. Here's the thing I want us to, to really get. Obedience, obedience is our responsibility. The outcome is God's. We, we've got to nail that down. Obedience is my job. Obedience is our job. Outcome's God's. Outcome is his, so make it personal. What promise has he given you that you need to keep walking towards? What promise have you been heading that direction for? See, God's not just wanting to win a battle for us. He's wanting to win a battle in us. And here, that you believe. We believe that we, we're sinking ourselves into this concrete confidence. That's what courage is. That's what Joshua is modeling in this moment. If you feel like you're circling today, maybe, maybe the, the first battle God wants to win is inside you. For the breakthrough is out there, the breakthrough is in here. And you know, you know, you know, you know, I've won this. I have won this. I have won this. And it happens in here. First, so here's, I think, a reassurance. Just because your progress isn't obvious doesn't mean your faith isn't working. Let me say that again. Just because your progress right now isn't obvious does not mean your faith is not currently at work does not mean your love is not currently at work. It does not mean your giving is not currently at work. You are giving God the thing he needs to access your life. Even if all you see right now after six laps is some ugly rock wall standing there. Keep going. The promise still stands. The promise still stands. I know there's questions inside, but the promise still stands. With all the rain we've been having, that rainbow in the sky, that is a promise of God saying, my promise still stands. It still stands. Whether we're seeing the end result yet or not, progress may not be obvious, but God is right now at work. Stay in faith. Keep going. Now, it's interesting. Uh, again, I segue into thoughts with this because you can read over this. God told Joshua how it's all going to happen. Joshua didn't tell the people how it's all going to happen. Did you notice that? He didn't say what's going to happen after each day. He didn't tell them how many days. He didn't tell them when the walls are going to fall. He didn't even tell them the walls are going to fall. Go back and read that. He just told them, here's the array. Here's how you're going to get out. Here's your marching order. Shut up and blow the trumpet and walk. And that's, that's, that's really it. That's all the instruction they got. And I'm thinking, I am Joe military guy. I'm like, all right, babe, oh, babe, I'll be back in the tent later. We're about to go take Jericho. Come on, guys. Come back after marching around day one. This is like, hey, how'd it go? Did y'all take Jericho? I mean, I don't know if they're all right in the sand trying to explain back to their wife and kids, like, hey, we can't talk until like this thing's over. I mean, like, okay, day two, 
So I hadn't talked to the wifey, and we're like, she's like, oh, you're going to take Jericho today. <laughs> you know, like, walk around, come back. Day three, day four, day five. The wifey's like, what are y'all doing? But you're looking fit. You know, like, <laughs> day six, I mean, by that, the guys are like, what's up? With Joshua? I mean, like, what in the world? Being asked to do something, you don't even know when the end of it is. Oh, day six, you go out to take Jericho and nothing again. Again. I just, I think it would have been easier if he had told him, hey, we're going to do this every day and seven day we're going to do it seven times, then it's going to happen. But you don't read that. I don't know why. I mean, again, I'm processing all the reasons why it's not in there, but he does not tell them how many days they're going to have to do this, but they can't talk, utter a word until it's done. Man, you talk about tough, tough, and you don't know how long you've got to keep walking towards the promise. Proverbs 13, 12, King Solomon writing this says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire that's fulfilled is a tree of life. And I, th- I think how he worded it, it's almost Yoda-ish. You know, it's like, it's like he gave the bad news first. You know, I, would, I would love to flip it around. Desire that is fulfilled is a tree of life, but you know, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Oh, it starts with our reality, typically. And he says, here's the thing you hold on to. It actually patterns the thing when we're pressing towards and we're not seeing it yet. So I don't know where you are. Are you on lap one of this thing? Are you in two? Are you three? I'm talking about that sweat equity. You've, man, you've been in prayer. You've been in tears. You've been crying over this thing. I don't know what it is or where you're at. Day four, day five, day six in the journey. All I can say is I get it. And the challenge is to keep walking and not stop at six. The third one, the last one. Lauren's going to come on back up. The challenge is when the process is open-ended. When you don't know when the end is. How long, Lord? How many times do I have got to forgive them? How much more do I have to give in this situation? Why am I still walking and it's not working? Am I talking to our reality now? And I was thinking about, any any of y'all ever watch like um, uh, race cars, uh, NASCAR, any any of that type of stuff? Does anybody know who watches uh, how the drivers after all the laps what is that? Left turn, left turn, left turn, left turn, whatever. How do, they, how do they know when it's the last lap? Anybody? Close. White flag. White flag. You know, you would think, man, it would be nice if life would just hold out the white flag. Tell us we're, we're, we're almost there. Last lap. But see, life doesn't. And oftentimes we don't get that from God either. And so the challenge is we don't see it and we don't know it's open-ended. And so what we do is we pull out our own white flag. But it's different. It's, It's our moment of surrender. I give up. I'm quitting. I'm throwing in the towel. Paul wrote again to Christians, to, to Christ followers and in the church of Galatia, the city in Galatians 6, 9, he says, let us not grow weary in doing good. See, if we just stop there, the only reason to tell us that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that God knows his kids get tired when it's open-ended, when we don't know when it finishes. So he says, don't grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time, come on, say it, proper time. Proper time. 
Different translations say appointed time. Some say right time. At the proper time, you will reap a harvest if. Mm, Say if. If. We do not give up. See what our part is to play in this? And it's not an easy part. But what Jesus tells us to do is to cast the care of it on him. For he cares for us. He says, I've overcome the world so you can not have to live discouraged, but you can have courage to keep walking. You have courage to not stop at six. We're believing. Come on, each of us, full manifestation. There's things we're believing for. Come on, Clayton, we're believing with you, bro. We're believing full manifestation. God has called us to believe, to keep moving forward, to elevate praise out of our mouth and not the problem. So what did Paul say to Philippian church? First chapter. See, this is faith talking. This isn't the seeing the natural. This is faith. This is what faith sounds like. For I am confident of this very thing. I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it the day of Christ Jesus. See, that's what faith sounds like, is I am confident, confident in he's got this. My job is obedience. His is the outcome. My job is faith. His is the outcome. It's His promise. So don't stop. So don't stop. Don't stop at six. Take another lap. Come on, keep believing. Day seven. You're on lap six of day seven. Don't stop. Keep going. See, we don't know how close we are. Don't stop. Just by simply reading chapter six of the book of Joshua, God's talking to us today. It's easy when your perspective is obstructed, it's clouded, it's murky, it's, oh God, I just feel overwhelmed in this moment. I don't know when this is going to be over. Just bow your heads real quick. Father God, I, I sense in my spirit you're, you're talking to us in a deep, intimate, caring, empathetic way like it's your kids and you know what we're going through. just as you spoke to Joshua in past tense, God, you knew this would be the day that this group of people would be in this room and this would be the topic on this portion of reading in Joshua. Not one person is here accidentally. This word was ordained for them to breathe life into them, to to bring wind into the sail of the ship again. real quick, just eyes closed, just heads bow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at you guys, but just need to, I need, I'm going to pray over you. I'm not embarrass you, but I need to pray over you. Who has been feeling this weariness of continuing? Just raise your hand. All right. Hands, man, hands everywhere. Hands, 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 hands. Just know, man, the majority of the people had their hands up in here. You are not alone. not alone. So God, I speak right now. Just, just if that was you, your hand up, now just take it and put it over your heart. Just where you're at. God, I speak against a spirit of weariness. Right now, we bind every spirit of depression, every voice of deception, every distraction. God, we loose 
today a spirit of tenacity. God, that faith would increase. Courage would be birthed again. Brought back to life the dreams that have been set to the side. God, we just say, yes, we'll obey. If that's you, just, just say, I receive that. I receive that. I receive that, God. Just I, I sense just a, 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 an unburdening. Here, just look at me real quick. Real quick. It's like what, the image in my head. Um, and maybe not everybody in the room can relate. If you've ever been skiing or like like the, the weight of the boots, maybe, maybe it was you're carrying a bunch of packs of something on a hike or luggage through the airport. Like in that moment, you take them off it's like oh the dogs have been barking you know what I'm saying like like it's just that relief God I just speak that relief God that we cast the care This is this maybe kind of hard to, 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 to fully say, but but I'm gonna explain it. Just just say I I don't care. Say that. This is kind of weird, but I don't care. God, we're choosing not to carry the care. The care is the anxiety. The care is the outcome. God, we are choosing to lay that down today name of Jesus. Come on, I invite you all to stand. We're, we're going to step into one last song. But I feel like some of us have, have got to take that further into this moment of praise. Because care has limited you. Some of y'all were here early through the, the, the first songs, but care caused something in you to just, just kind of coast through. I feel like there's a moment now the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into where care is gone and now we get to praise. We get to worship. We get to elevate the God who has the outcome. So God, we choose today, we choose today to praise. Come on, Lord, let's take, take a few minutes into that.
Jesus, you're worthy. You're worthy of all praise and all honor. All glory to him who sits on the throne. Worthy are you, King. We choose in this moment to set aside the things, the cares of life that we've been choosing to carry. We lay it at your feet, Jesus ruler of our hearts we give space for you to be in charge once again thank you for what you're doing in this moment church don't miss it don't miss it lay it at his feet Thank you for watching the Highway YouTube channel. We trust that God spoke to you right where you are. Please take the time to hit the subscribe button to follow us each week. Be sure to share it with a friend. You can support the ministry by heading over to our church website at highwaycommunity.com. Look for the donate tab and help us continue to reach our world with the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. God bless and have a wonderful week.